Am I supposed to announce? Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, Susan. Okay. Hi, guys. We are now live on air. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. You heard Susan just now. She'll be coming on in two minutes. Um, I'm Regina Yao, founder and president of the Pixel Project, and I'm moderating the ninth Google Hangout session of now live on air. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. You and sorry about that, guys. There's an echo going on. Right. So I'm moderating the ninth Google Hangout session of the third annual fall edition of our Read for Pixels campaign. So through Read for Pixels, the Pixel Project is collaborating with 11 award-winning best-selling authors to raise awareness about violence against women and to raise funds towards the celebrity male role model Pixel Reveal campaign, which aims to raise $1 million for the cause to end violence against women. We'll also be telling you more about the Read for Pixels fundraiser, which has lots and lots and lots and lots of exclusive author goodies a little later in this session. And you can find out more about the Pixel Project and what to do about violence against women um, by visiting www.thepixelproject.net. Now, today we have a super awesome guest in our Google Hangout. Um, please join me in welcoming New York Times bestselling author Susan Denner. Uh, Susan has come a long way from small town Georgia. As a marine biologist, she got to travel the world six out of seven continents to be exact. She'll get to Asia one of these days. Yes, Susan, you have to come to Asia. I mean, yes. you have to come. I know, I know, I know. Um, and Susan did all this globe trotting uh, before she settled down as a full-time novelist editor. She lives in the Midwest with her husband and two dogs, and she is extremely active on social media. Yay, we see you on Twitter, Susan. Definitely active. Um, and you can find Susan on her blog, Twitter, or The Misfits and Daydreamers, her weekly newsletter on all things book and writing. And Susan has also generously donated an awesome Truth Witch goodie bundle comprising a signed and personalized first edition hardcover of Truth Witch, a special science Truth Witch poster with a map of the Witchlands world on one side, and Truth Witch sayings and I think sigils on the other side. And um, Susan has just got a surprise for us. We'll be adding a big surprise on Susan. Um, to the goodie bundle after this hangout. So hold your horses so that you get the surprise as well. And the surprise is Susan, who is also a writing instructor, will donate, will also include a, t a critique of a submission of 10 pages of your story, 10 double space pages. So um, please do not rush off to the Indiegogo page yet. We have to, Susan has, just, Susan has just told this to us. So we will get that up. We will get that included in the perk and adjust the donation request accordingly. Uh, it won't be too much. Susan and us know that you guys need something reasonable. Anything will, you know, support is great. So we'll show you the little slide when we get to the end so you know where to go. And um, yeah, so you can go to the go there to donate and give generously because all funds go to a helping stop violence against women. Now, over to Susan, who is raring to go. Susan, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Hi. Um, yeah, hi. I'm coming at you from my one of my offices. I'm spoiled. I've taken over my whole house, and this is the guest room that I also work in because there's a whiteboard. And Susan, you're going to be reading. Uh, oh, yes. Do I need to start with that? Yes. You just, yes. You just tell me what to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to read from Truth Witch. Uh, I am a horrible reader, and I apologize for what is to come. Uh, I will do my best. This is chapter 7. Um, and essentially, we have our two leading ladies. They've just been separated for the first time in a long time. And um, Assault is not doing so well with that. So let's see how she fares. Assault ducked into the street behind the wharf as ordered by Habim. Hunching deep beneath the scratchy hood, she wefted her way through horses and carts, merchants and guild lackeys, and threads of every imaginable shade and strength. At last, 
she caught sight of a stamped wooden sign that declared the Hawthorne Canal. Assault recognized it now. Sophie had played tarot here a few months ago. Yet, unlike last night, she'd actually won. A splash of white beneath the sign caught Assault's eyes, glaring and conspicuous against the smear of colors that was a Vinyatza city thoroughfare. It was a Carowin monk with no threads. None. Assault's insides iced over. She froze mid-step, watching the monk stride down the street away from her. He was clearly on the hunt. Every few steps he would pause, and the back of his hood would tilt as if he sniffed the air. It was his lack of threads, though, that kept Assault immobile. She'd thought she'd simply missed the blood witch's threads in the wildness of the fight yesterday, but no, he still bore no threads, which was impossible. Everyone had threads. End of story. You want a rug? asked a carpet salesman, pushing in close to Assault, all sweat-stained robes and heavy breathing. Mine are straight from Asmir, but I'll give you a good deal. Assault flicked up a flat palm. Back away, or I will cut off your ears and feed them to the rats. Normally this threat served Assault well. Normally, though, she was in the Northern Wharf District, where her Namatsi skin went mostly ignored, and normally she had Sophie at her side to show teeth and look suitably terrifying. Today, Assault had none of those things. And unlike Sophie, who would have reacted instantly, who would have run at first sight of the monk, Assault only wasted more time evaluating her terrain. It was in that two-breath pause that the carpet vendor shoved in closer and squinted beneath her hood. His threads blazed into gray-black fear and hate. Motsi scum, he has swiping fingers across his eyes. Then he lunged, voice lifting as he tore back Assault's hood. Get away, Motsi scum, get away! Assault hardly needed that second command. She was finally doing what Safi would have done from the start. She got away. Or she tried to, but traffic was stopping to ogle her, to close in. Everywhere she turned or jerked, she met eyes locked on her face, her skin, her hair. She jolted back from threads of gray fear and steely violence. The commotion attracted the Carowin's attention. He stopped his forward trek, swiveled toward the rising shouts of the crowd, and looked directly at Assault. Time stretched out and the crowd shank back, blurring into a quilt of threads and sound. For a fraction of a heartbeat that felt like eternity, all Assault saw were the young monk's eyes, red eddied across the palest blue she'd ever seen, like blood melting through ice, like a heart thread twining through blue threads of understanding. Vaguely, Assault wondered how she'd missed that flawless blue leather at the holdup. As all of these thoughts careened through her brain at a thousand leagues a second, she wondered if this monk would really hurt her, like everyone feared. Then the monk's lips rippled back, he bared his teeth, and the paws in the world fractured. Time flooded forward, resumed its normal speed, and Assault finally ran, bolting behind a gray horse. She chucked her elbow hard into its lower rump, it reared. The young woman on its back screamed, and with that burst of high-pitched vocals and the sudden violent whinnying from the horse, the entire street surged out of the way. Orange frantic threads flared around Assault, but she barely registered them. She was already shoving and sprinting for an intersection one block back. There was a bridge over the nearest canal there. Maybe if she could cross the canal, she could lose the blood witch. Her feet thrashed through mud, hopped over beggars, skidded around carts, but then halfway to the bridge she glanced back and wished she hadn't. The Blood Witch was definitely pursuing, and he was definitely fast. The same people who'd been on, intent on slowing Assault now cleared out of his path. Move, Assault shrieked at a purist with his repent sign. He didn't move, so she clipped him on the shoulder. He and his sign went spinning like a windmill, but it worked in Assault's favor. For even though she lost speed, even though she was forced to dive beneath a passing litter carried by four men, it looked as if she lamed, aimed left for the bridge. And she heard the purist bellowing to go after her across the canal. So she didn't go left as she planned. Instead, she slung right on her heel and aimed straight back into traffic, praying the monk listened to the purist and went left, praying, desperately praying, that he couldn't smell her blood through these salamander fibers. She foisted her hood in place and hurtled onward. There was another intersection coming up, a thick flow of traffic east to west toward a second bridge. She'd have to barrel through, continue straight, or not, just as she pelted behind a woodcutter's cart and popped around a cheesemonger's stall, she hit empty air. Assault tossed her arms wide, teetering toward an unexpected canal of green, sludgy waters, almost as packed with people as the streets. Then a long, flat-hulled pram slid beneath Assault, and in half a breath she absorbed the scene below. Shallow deck covered in nets, fishermen gaping up at me. Assault stopped fighting her fall. Instead, she leaned into it. Air rushed against her. White lacy nets closed in fast. Then she was on the deck, knees bending, hands catching herself. Something sliced through her palm. 
A rusted hook, she realized, before she scrabbled upright. The pram listed wildly. The fisherman roared. But a salt was already pumping toward the next passing boat, a low ferry with a frilly red awning. Look out, a salt shouted, lunging high and grabbing hold of the balustrade. She hauled herself up as wide-eyed passengers reared back. Blood smeared on the railing's pickets. Faintly, she hoped this burning slash didn't make her that much easier to follow for the blood witch. She screwed it across the ferry in four bounds. It would seem everyone wanted a salt off the boat as badly as she did. She topped the railing, sucked in a breath while another pram coasted by, this one covered in the day's mackerel. She jumped. Her feet squished, and suddenly she was sprawling on silver scales with a face full of gooey eyes. The fisherman shrieked at her, more displeased than surprised, and Assault hefted herself up to find his black beard bearing down. She pushed past, elbowing him in the gut right as they cruised by a low staircase clumped with pole fishermen. A rough jump later, and Assault latched on to the flagstone stairs. None of the fishermen offered to help. They only shuddered back. One even stabbed at her with his fishing pole, his threads a terrified gray. Assault grabbed the end of the pole. The man's threads blazed brighter, and he tried to yank back the pole, but proceeded to yank up Assault instead. Thank you, she thought, straggling up the stairs. She glanced back once and saw blood streaked on the stones. Her palm was gushing a lot more than the distant pain warranted. She reached the traffic. She reached the street. street. Traffic swarmed past, and she scrabbled for some strategy. All of her plans were falling through the hell gates, but surely Assault could take a moment to think. She was crap at running pell-mell. It was why Sophie was the leader in these situations. Without time to strategize, this will always write herself into corners. But as she stood there, slinking alongside the canal and clutching her bleeding hand in her cloak, she got the moment she needed. Wide road, she thought, a maid artery from town, likely alongside this canal the whole way. Traffic organized in two directions, and a man leading a saddled, brindle mare, no sweat darkening the mare's shoulders. If I take her, I can flee the city entirely and hide overnight with the tribe. The returning to the home she'd spent most of her life avoiding was hardly a Salt's ideal solution. The Bedinzi settlement was the only place she knew of that wouldn't kick her out at first sight of her skin. It was also the only place she felt certain the Blood Witch, even if he hunted her by sight and by blood, couldn't follow. The round lands around the settlement were riddled with traps that no non medinzi could navigate. So in a flurry of speed, Assault shrugged off her cloak, tossed it over the man's head, and then vaulted into the mare's saddle, praying all the while that the mare's flattening ears were a sign she was ready to ride. I'm so sorry, she shouted as the man flailed beneath the cloak. I'll send her back. Then she dug in her heels and left the man behind. As the mare launched into a fast trot through traffic, Assault flung her gaze across the canal and found the blood witch watching her. There were gaps in the boats now. He couldn't cross the water as she had, but he could smirk at her and wave too. a flicker of his right fingers and then a tapping of his right palm. He knew her hand was bleeding and he was telling her he could follow, that he would follow and likely be smiling that terrifying smile all the way. Assault tore her gaze from his face, forcing her attention ahead. As she pressed low onto the mare's back and kicked the horse even faster, she prayed the Moon Mother or Noden or any other god that might be watching would help her get out of the city alive. The end. Yay! I really... Yay. I, I hope I didn't read too fast. I talk really fast when I'm reading. Sorry, guys. Yeah, so let's start with the, oh, there's an echo. So guys, sorry about this. For some reason, my mic's echoing today. So, <laughs> all right, so let's get started with the questions. And everyone, if you have any questions, please type your questions in the chat box next to the screen. Anusha, who's today's moder chat box moderator, will make sure that uh, the questions get to me and I can read them out loud to Susan to um, answer. Um, but Susan will have to go within the hour. She'll tr we'll try and get it wrapped up just before the hour because Susan has a very, very important thing to do, which is to finish Wind Witch. We're so close, guys. It's so close, but it has to go to print soon and I want to make sure it's as good as possible. Yay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first question is, the female characters in Truth Witch are kick-ass, complex women with agency, and there are some really formidable people among them, including Safia, Isolde, Ebrain, and Vanessa. So what and who inspires you to create such fabulous female characters? Wow. Um, I guess I don't really have a specific answer for that. Um, I guess I'm simply inspired by all the women that I know and have encountered. Um, 
I can't say that I've ever met a weak woman. So if I'm going to write a woman, then she's going to be like the women I know, which is strong. Yeah, because what I noticed from reading um, Truthbridge is that you basically cover the gamut, the whole range of different, the different ways that women can be, are strong, can be strong, how they deal with their problems. They all deal with it in very different ways. This is um, true. Yeah, and it's, it, you know, it, it's, in a way, it's, I don't know whether it's sad or what, but I noticed that not, that this is not common. Like, not many books do this. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, gosh, I, again, it's, a, it's not something I set out to do. Uh, I just wrote the characters that spoke to me. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think strength comes in many, many different forms. Uh, as well as just sort of how we not only tackle problems but react to them, and um, it amazes me how how very different um, we can we can be. I like I have a sister and a mother, and I would say that all three of us are very 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 different, but we're each strong in our own ways. Um, although we're also like all kind of blonde, so when we get together, I joke that we get stupider. Um, because somehow, like, when the three of us are together, we just do dumb things over and over again. I don't understand. It's like our blonde starts showing when we're together. That's like Sorry. a little bit like, um, that's a little bit like Safia and Isol, right? The beginning, <laughs> kind of. the beginning of the book where um, they're like, oh, why did I do this? Without, you know, because Safia could, Isol tried to, tried to, it, gambling? She was gambling, right? And she was trying to win a whole stack of money and she just couldn't and then they got tricked that yeah. was awesome. yeah um i mean I, i'm sure you and, and anyone watching you've had a best friend um or maybe not even a best friend but just someone you got into mischief with and so yes those friendships have always been pretty awesome in my life uh so yes yeah i mean what, what struck me was i mean this um, you know, a lot of things that we like to talk about in Read for Pixels are stereotypes because a lot of times when authors write female characters, somehow it sort of falls back into stereotype. And when you think about, you know, a partners in crime with, um, you know, you and your best friend getting into trouble, you usually think of boys rather than girls. But when I read about Sophia and Isol getting into trouble like that, I started laughing. <laughs> yeah. It's real. It's pretty real because girls get into trouble too. Like, oh, yeah. Know. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I had my best friend when I was a kid and still, like, a really dear friend of mine, I, one of my best friends. I, but she was, like, my, you know, my, my Sophia to my assault from, like, age eight until I graduated high school and like, boy, we got into some trouble. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, yes, we got into easily as much trouble as our brothers. Okay. Um, oh, um, we have a question from the audience. Um, Melissa Lee says, I know oh, you're not yeah. finished yet. Yep. Hi, Melissa. Um, <laughs> I know you're not finished yet, but can you pick five words to describe Windwitch. This is from Ooh. Melissa. Ooh. Okay, I mean, I'm finished enough to certainly be able to do that. It's just, we're in the final stages, guys. We're in the final stages. This book, for those of you who follow me, know how hard it's been, so thank you for all your support over the last year. I love you. Um, Melissa, fun question. Uh, five words, let's see. Um, oh, that's hard. Enemies, allies, um, scope, because like the scope is spreading, stakes, because the stakes are getting higher, um, and this is two words, but I'm lumping it together, inner strength, because I feel like each of the characters in this book is having to tap into a new kind of strength for them. You'll see soon. Yay, and there you have it, Melissa. I really, really want to read Windwitch. It's oh, thanks. You left us on the cliffhanger at the end of it. <laughs> Not on purpose, but yes, there is. I realized after it was done and people were like, that was a cliffhanger. I was like, really? I didn't need for that to happen. Sorry. 
So, uh, you know, so you're writing instructor as well, instructor as well. So getting back to uh, what we were previously talking about. So as I mentioned just now, you know, a lot of times authors seem to also fall back on female stereotypes. So how do you work around that to create very distinctive, positive and empowered women? In your That's a very big question. I can't say that it is something I conscientious, like I think of when I write. Um, I, I think a lot of authors when we write first drafts, our, all of our characters and our dialogue tends to be kind of two dimensional. Mm -hmm. For me anyway, certainly, um, and the magic really happens, especially for me in revisions, and that's when I, I really layer back in the depth um, of what I was trying to achieve, who I was trying to build, but perhaps didn't achieve that in my first draft, and I layer that back in. Um, but I don't know. It's not, it's not necessarily something I, I think about. I think something that I... I really, I know that I think about is that um, it's not enough just to give a character like a flaw, right? Like we always think about like, oh, well this character is going to be arrogant and that's their flaw. Um, but that's not necessarily like a real flaw, that's a pseudo flaw to me um, because it's not necessarily something that's not only hurting, it's hurting themselves and others. And so I try to make whatever it is that the character has, it's, it's a problem not just for the people around them, but it's a problem for them. And if they don't overcome their arrogance, for example, then they're never going to be the hero of the story that we need. So I do try to think about, like, you know, what is that extra layer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in Truth Witch, sisterhood and female empowerment take center stage in the story. And one of the best things about Truth Witch is, as we were chatting about just now, Safian is Zolt's friendship. And it sticks out to us because because female friendship isn't usually at the forefront of fantasy books, um, especially high fantasy. So do you find any challenges in writing Safiya and Isol's friendship? It, it, you said that it, just now you talked about your own friendships. Yeah, I mean, no, gosh, I had no trouble writing that. Um, it's actually been a lot harder in the second one because they are in separate places. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's actually going to struggle for me because these two characters are so, they are a unit in many ways, um, as I was with all the various best friends that I've had in my life. And so, um, and now am I am in many ways with my husband. So yeah, I, I just, that was a, something I just did. I don't know. I never like set out to like, oh, I'm going to write a female friendship book for fantasy. Uh, it just happens to be what the book was about. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any great answers. <laughs> no, I mean, like, when we talked to Josephine Angelini, like, a couple of weeks ago, she yeah. was talk we're talking about sisterhood, because in her book, in, in her, her book, um, her books, there's a female, uh, there's a pair of sisters, and even in different worlds, they're saying, hello, you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm here. Yeah, you froze for a bit. Um, so she talked about how a lot of the conversations in that book actually reflected her own conversations with her sister. So that any of the hijinks that Safiya and Isol get up to sort of reflect in a way stuff that um, you do? No, I mean, that, no, nothing specific. Uh, I, I more pulled, like especially the opening scene. Um, do you guys, anyone viewing, know the, um, the animated Robin Hood from Disney with the foxes? Um, I like was totally trying to copy that kind of a dynamic that Little John and Robin Hood have when they they pull off these great capers. Um, so that's that's like sort of what I was trying to do. Certainly, at least in the opening scene. Um, but it's sad. Like the, I have to say that a lot of my inspiration in terms of how they actually interacted is based on like male friendships that I saw in media. Um, like one of my favorite friendship relationships is on Psych, which is Sean and Gus, and they have a hilarious back and forth. And I, I wanted to have something similar to that in Truth, which that's sort of um, we're two very different people, but we can't function without the other that you see in Psych. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, why do you think? Like we were talking about, like you mentioned the male friendships, and earlier I mentioned male friendships uh, in stories and and TV shows and stuff. And 
Why do you think that positive takes on female friendship is still not very common in pop culture? I mean, we do see them in, you know, films that are marketed as chick flicks, for example, like right. Right. No Man and maybe some Nora Ephron films, but it's still like, that's why Truthfish is such a breath of fresh air because it's, whoa, this is a pair of women who are, like you said, very different. But they're such fast friends and they keep getting each other into trouble and they keep getting each other out of trouble. Out of it. Why do you think it's not very common yet? You know, I think a lot of it has to do with just that as growing up, we're, we're often taught that uh, female women are competition, unfortunately. Uh, and we are not, as women, we're not given a way to uh, express negative feelings in the same way that men are. We can't like get mad. We're not supposed to get mad. We're not supposed to, you know, yell and, and punch things. Um, and so we end up holding our negative feelings in, which turns into manipulations. And oftentimes we end up doing those manipulations on each other. Uh, and I think as a result, we've ended up with this sort of, unfortunately, toxic idea of what female friendships can become and it's true they can i'm not i i don't i actually do think that not only can female friendships be the most empowering relationships we have but they can also be the most heartbreaking more so than we ever have um in terms of our romantic relationships and yeah so i think that as a result the way just that women handle um negativity and express anger and things like that has led to a darker side of friendship that maybe men don't have. Men just kind of like, you know, they're like, hey man, let's duke it out, have a beer, we're good. And we don't have that, we have no way of expressing that. Uh, and yeah, and so that's been picked up uh, by lots of things, you know, you get the femme fatale, um, women are manipulative, women, you know, we we nag, we we hide what we're really feeling and things like that, so, I. I yeah, that's that's my interpretation of the situation and why I think it continues to persist until until women are taught how to like we're given a way to actually express our feelings and our anger and our our hurt. Uh, we're gonna keep seeing it. Yeah. So let's take a break from these heavy questions and <laughs> actually there is one here that's related. So Asteria Gonzalez. Um, hi. hi. Um, she says, um, hello, Susan, do you find that events in your own life appear in your writing? For example, failed relationships, successes, etc. Yeah, um, yes and no. Uh, I have, interestingly, Windwitch, this newest book, it's maybe the most personal yet, uh, in terms of like, uh, we get to into more sibling relationships and, um, I have not always had like a wonderful relationship with my siblings. It's only that now that we are adults that I feel like we're finally kind of getting to know each other, which I think happens a lot. Um, and so I wanted to explore that personally. And I think that's in Windwich, and I think that's maybe like the most personal I've ever dug in terms of like drawing on real things in my life for a book. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, and I'm sure everybody will want to know this. Who was your inspiration for Merrick? <laughs> I don't have an inspiration for Merrick. I just wanted to have like a attractive, appealing, uh, short-tempered pirate captain. And he's not really a pirate, but that was the original idea was like to have a captain of a ship. Um, and I honestly didn't think that he, spoiler alert, that he and Safi would have any chemistry. And then they kind of did, but we'll see, see where that goes. Um, I, there's definitely not any inspiration specifically for really any character. Um, I, like, I, I think that's risky if you try to like imitate a, per a character after a person in your life. Like um, in my first series, the, the mother character is pretty awful. And my mom came to me and she was like, is this based on me? I was like, no mother, of course not. <laughs> it's fiction. Um, and that's, yeah, that's how it is. I, the characters are like real people in my head and I feel like they're a combination of all the different kinds of people I've met in my life, but they're never based expressly on one person. 
Okay, so you mentioned your mom, and that kind of leads us straight into our next question, uh, which there are indications that Isolde's mom suffered from sexual harassment, but was resourceful and powerful enough to stage an escape, even when Isolde suddenly tumbled back into her life after she sent Isolde away. So they sort of, I think they sort of accel accelerated their plans, right? So why did you choose to show violence against women in this way instead of a full-on sexual assault scene? Um, because first of all, like the last thing I want to do is for anyone to read this series and feel triggered in any way because I definitely want the series to be something that you can go to uh, as an escape. Mm -hmm. um, but also, there are some things that not all readers are ready for. So you can interpret what happened to Gretchen in your own way. Does that make sense? It's left yeah. off the page. It's left very open. So you can interpret it um, how you are ready as a reader. Because I do have very young readers. And I don't think it's appropriate to have certain things in books you know, for young readers. Um, and at least not a book like this. This is not mm -hmm. the stage for that. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's sort of why I chose not to show anything on the page. And, and also because I don't know that at the end of the day, um, it doesn't define Gretchen. So, yeah, she's getting out of a bad situation, she and Alma, um, that extends beyond just that. And, and yeah, at the end of the day, it doesn't define who she is. So that's, that's why I handled it the way I did. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because, you know, one thing I was thinking of that when I was reading it, uh, Truthbridge, is that you know I was I have a niece who's twelve, and I'm going to introduce Truthbridge to her, and I think that would be a very interesting jumping off point for her to ask me questions about the issue of sexual harassment, street harassment, because as you said, it's not very in your face, but it gets people to think, it gets them thinking about the issue. Um, because it must have been, I mean, the one thing that readers, I think, can draw from that is that it must have been such a bad situation, bad enough that she's been, she and Alma have been plotting this escape for, was it months? It, it seemed like they were doing yeah. it for months. Yeah, it's been like a long, long time. It was a long, long time to pull themselves out of, yeah, of, of the bad tribe situation. Um, and, yeah, and I, I mean, partly, too, I needed or I wanted to show like what sort of the assault grew up in, um, mm -hmm. even though she didn't have the same experiences that Gretchen had. It's like a realization point for assault as well, the, the links that our parents go to protect us from what's out there. Um, and I don't think it, most of us even begin to realize how much our parents have done for us um, until we're a little bit older and we can we start to actually understand what's happening in the world around us. So, yeah. Yeah. So we have another question from the audience. Um, it's from uh, someone who did not give their name, but their handle is a reader under the sea. And I under the sea. It's a very, very short question. <laughs> Merrick or, or Edwin? Oh. Oh, no, I can't say. No, that's awful. I won't choose. I won't choose. Um, I like them both. They're very, very, very different. Um, Adrian is much easier for me to write. So in that regard, I like him. Um, he's such a subtext character. Like, he's hiding so much. Um, he's so unreliable. And he's really fun. He was a surprise. I never expected to write his character, not from his point of view. So that was an awesome surprise with Truth Witch. Um, but, and Merrick, on the other hand, is like incredibly hard for me to write. Um, and I think in many ways, because he's maybe a lot like me, uh, we take on the problems of the world and make them our own, and we're not very good at asking other people for help. Um, and that is, is something that I am, I like struggle with as a human, and I struggled with with him in, in the second book, like how to write that. So I can't choose. I can't choose. OK, so going back to our discussion, um, we see very different expressions and incarnations of female empowerment in Truth Witch, and this results in a very diverse cast of female characters. For example, Ed Rain is a skilled healer and fighter who has nurtured and mentored both boys and girls, so Edwin, and to a certain extent, Isolde, I think. 
And Vanessa is insanely powerful. She's an insanely powerful Iron Witch who would do anything for her country. And Vivian is just power hungry and just wants to get rid of everybody so she can rule. Um, do you sort of, I know you say you don't deliberately, you said before you did not deliberately plan all that, but did you at some point in the book while writing it realize, oh, I have, that you have such a diverse range of female characters. It really is. Thank you. I mean, I'm glad. It's again, no, I didn't. Um, I did. I definitely do. I, I I'm trying to shift my default as a writer to always being a female. So, which is it's strangely hard because I feel like we're inundated with all characters being male that we see on TV and in books. You know, even the like little side characters who walk on and serve your character coffee. It'll be a dude. And so I'm trying to like make every every character that I can be a woman, which is maybe overdone. Um, but no, it was not something I thought about. Um, I, I've thought about, to some extent, like what each character really is. Um, for example, uh, Vivia is not what you think she is, and I can't wait for you guys to see her true side. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's uh, what I set out to do with the series, for better or worse, was to create a world where there were no villains. And that is, I don't recommend it if you're a writer because it makes it very, very hard to know when the end is because you don't just have a villain that you bring down. Um, and therefore, oh, he who shall not be named is dead. We won. There is none of that. And so it's been very challenging as a writer, but also really rewarding because you get to see that the people we think in the book, as well as perhaps think in our own real life, are not perhaps the villains that we make them out to be. So that in itself is its own strength. Okay, so Melissa Lee has another question. Wow, yes. you're coming in. Yeah. Yay, guys, keep asking your questions because Susan has to run off in about 25 minutes to go to go finish her, <gasps> finish Vin Witch. Yes. yes. Uh, so Melissa says, uh, asks, um, who are some of your favorite female friendships you've read about in or seen in shows and films? Um, that's a good question, and I always struggle with this question, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, because there, there are a few kinds of female friendship that I get, you see a lot on TV, um, in books, or in movies, um, and that often is the, like, big sister, little sister relationship, which I like. I'm a big sister myself. Um, one of the first ones that comes to mind is uh, Anara and Kaylee on Firefly. If you guys haven't seen that show, you need to watch that show. Um, as well as uh, Katara and Toph on Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, they have sort of like, maybe it's a slow start friendship, but it slowly does become a thing. Um, but it's, it's still very much just like one character is taking on the role of the big sister, the mentor to the other. Um, and it's very... Like, I really struggle to find a character where, where it's, or two characters that are evenly balanced. Um, yeah, it's so sad and so terrible that I can't come up with anything off the top of my head. Hmm. So maybe, yeah. we'll start, maybe, you know, one day there'll be a the adaptation of Truth Way. Uh, that would be cool. Will, and everyone will look would, at it as female friendships. As, <laughs> as the, as, yeah, I would be cool with that. I'm okay with that. Yeah, okay, so um, so the next question. Guys, keep piling in your questions. We'll keep discussing. Um, Susan and I will keep the discussion going, and I'll weave in your questions as I go along. Um, so um, geek culture in general, including science fiction and fantasy, has had its share of critics saying that it's still too male-dominated despite the rising number of prominent and well-respected female authors. And, you know, we get a lot of news coming out of cons and all that, you know, about harassment and, and worse than harassment. And what do you think needs to be done to make geek culture as a whole, whether it's books or films or gaming or comics, you know, more welcoming for women and girls? Good Lord, if we knew the answer to that, we could do it. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with culture as a whole, honestly. Uh, anytime you have a field that's pretty male-dominated, it's very hard for women to crack in, and men don't like... 
I shouldn't just say men, this happens I'm sure with female dominated fields when men try to enter it. Um, people, we get territorial. We, we get territorial of what we like and um, we don't like people who we don't think are worthy stepping in. And for whatever reason, women have been for a long time deemed unworthy, particularly in the gaming world, um, which I will admit is a big fear of mine as a lover of gaming. I am terrified of that culture, which sucks. Um, and yeah, I, I don't really know what should be done. I feel like educating people when they're young, starting with boys, uh, really teaching them that you know, women are at equal to you. It would be a great start um, because I'm not quite sure how you can get through to adult men. If I knew, then I would be doing it for sure. Uh, yeah, I really don't know. I mean, I definitely have had my fair share of like harassment at cons, physical harassment at cons. I've had my fair share of like being considered unworthy because I'm a woman writer by male writers. It's just sad that it's such a like accepted part of it that I just kind of don't even pay attention anymore um, and perhaps that's also part of the problem the fact that I just kind of accept it and move on I don't know I don't have a solution I wish I did yeah you're kind of breaking up a little yourself but you know one um, one author Christopher Golden is going to be a guest next week he he was talking about how we all need to see how the men and cons who are decent men like maybe we should start being women, as in you know if um, if if woman or a minority experiences harassment, then they should be able to feel safe to come to someone like him, and then he would commit to going and helping them report it and supporting them and all that. Or you know, he just said I think that that's awesome idea, yeah. To create a safe environment for women and minorities. In the, at cons, that was his idea, and maybe that might work. Yeah, it definitely would. It sucks that we still need men to do it for us. Uh, it's the way of it. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, at the end of the day, too. Like I, when I'm at cons, I definitely seek out women, and mm -hmm. so it also could just help if, if women, you know, if we really like made an active effort to band together at events like this and. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I, I think it's getting better though. It's definitely, like, I, I do go to a lot of cons and it's, it's the harassment thing has gotten definitely a lot better in the last few years. So there's, there's an outcry and people are listening. Okay. Oh, uh, Estera Gonzalez has another question. It's, it's a fun one. She says, is that, is the background, your background, your writing room? Yes, it is. This is one of, I have two offices, which is shameful. This is technically the guest room, but uh, I took it over um, because I do that where at my house. I basically own every room in this house now. My husband hates it. Uh, but yes, I have like a whiteboard on the wall, so you're probably seeing spoilers from the next book right now. Yee. And some like fan art and other random brain storming things that I did with uh, my editor and agent and yeah this room's kind of a mess and I'm sorry that you're seeing it. Oh and cue everyone sort of getting close to their screen and squinting yeah, and trying to read. <laughs> oh, my <God. laughs> oh yeah good luck guys read my handwriting. <laughs> okay so um, let's try and go to the last three questions on, and the discussion thing, and then yeah. we'll make a little announcement about um, about the goodie that uh, Susan has donated, so that right. you know you can go pick it up if you make make the donation request. But we'll get back to that in about five to ten minutes. Um, so, as an author, do you feel it's important for you to portray? Examples of healthy, respectful relationships in your novels between men and women, and between women. Um, and do yes. you think it's important for stories to that prominently feature women like yours to pass the Bechdel test, which is where women talk to each other about something other than a man? Than a man. Um, yes, 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 yes. All of that, yes. Um, there is nothing that drives me crazier than um, what I deem an unhealthy relationship in, in uh, especially in YA, because you know we're young readers. 
that tend to be more impressionable. Um, and I mean, yeah, I, I guess everyone has a different idea of what's healthy. And so it's hard to, to say that my idea of it is the same as maybe other people's, but, um, I do, I do think it's really important to show good relationships and possibly even bad ones in which the heroine learns something. Um, and of course the Bechdel test, yeah, that should be like a duh for every book everywhere. Okay. So in your opinion, how can authors strike a balance in their storytelling between raising awareness about sexism and violence against women um, and telling the story without being pedantic? How can authors strike a balance between getting a message across and entertaining people at the same time and not making it seem like they're being preachy? Right. Um, I mean, that's... That's a balance for all writers have to deal with anyway. Oftentimes we are trying to get some kind of a theme or message out. And the last thing you want to do is be preachy. Um, but I guess, you know, ultimately we learn along with the main characters. So if our, if our protagonist is learning something um, and it happens to be something to do with violence against women or violence in general, um, then the reader's going to learn that too. So um, again, it's, it's it's all about the subtlety. It's all about the showing how a character reacts and perceives something, right? Because when you read, you're not reading, you're not seeing what's actually there, right? You're reading it through the filter of the of the narrator of the story of the protagonist, oftentimes, and so depending on how the protagonist views or the narrator views and interprets what's going on around them is exactly how we can get a message across. Um, to go back to Gretchen and her situation with the tribe, Assault's mother, I, I mean, again, um, there's a message there and hopefully it's subtle enough that you don't even necessarily realize you're getting it, so. Hmm. Okay, there are a couple more uh, questions from the audience and a couple more questions from me. So let's go to a short one from the audience. Um, Karina Romano. Um, hi, hi, Karina. Karina. Um, she says, will we be seeing some new places in Wind Witch? Yes, you will. You are going to get new places and new people. Uh, most of this book is set in Nubrovna in the capital and also in um, the spit of land next to Nubrovna where we have the Pirate Republic. There's a lot going on there, and then some other things around that area. So yes, it's pretty much all new locations. There's a Pirate Republic? That's so cool. Yes, the Pirate Republic of Saldonica. And I'm afraid Safi and the and Vanis get stuck there. So yes, things happen. OK, everybody, we really all need to go get <laughs> when she comes out. Uh, I think okay. there'll be arcs in November, so get ready. Okay, so um, going back to one of my questions, and we have to quickly try to quickly wrap up everything. Yeah, um, yeah. So in your opinion, how can authors like yourself best support efforts to kick off social change to end violence against women? Again, this is a very big question. Um, I mean, I, I obviously, I think the best I th authors, we're lucky that we have a platform. So it's up to us to use our platform um, for good. Uh, and I try to do that personally on my blog and through a newsletter, um, things like this. And I, I think that's like the number one way that authors can actually like really dig in and do good is to, to teach by example, so to speak. Um, but I also think that it's up to us to write it in our books and to, to teach through entertainment. Um, yeah, like I, 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 research this sort of stuff a lot because it, it's just important to me. And um, and the more you know, the more you notice when it's not uh, happening in the in the media and fiction that you consume. And I, I have to say that I'm ultimately like incredibly disappointed with TV and movies because they very rarely pass the Bechdel test, even today. Um, movies that I love, which come on guys, really, how hard is it? And so, uh, yeah, it's up to us to, included in our works and also to use the platforms that we have to, to get the message out there. 
So. Yeah. Okay, so a couple. Okay, so there's a question for you from Colombia, from Carolina. Ooh. Yeah. Hi, Carolina. Hi, Carolina. Yeah. So she says, "Hello, Susan. Greetings from Colombia. Smiley face. Um, what's your favorite and least favorite part about being an author?" <laughs> um, okay. Uh, my favorite part, the good stuff, is that I love doing events. I'm like that person. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert, but I'm super social, and I love meeting new people, like, to the point where I think it really annoys my friends because I, like, they have to, like, keep me on a leash or I'll just wander off and talk to everyone, and um, and I'm that person who will talk to you on the airplane, so if you're ever seated next to me, watch out. I'm going to talk your ear off for the whole flight, um, but I, like, so I love it. I love, like, doing events and meeting readers, and I'm really, I talk too much, so I get in trouble because I hold up the line because I'm talking so much to the people. But it's, like, the highlight of the job, right? I sit by myself all day long writing books, and now I get to finally meet the people who consume the books, the people I wrote the book for. So, yes, I love events. Um, I love meeting people. Uh, and then the least favorite part of the job, I mean, I love hate writing. Like, I love writing. I love telling stories. I love having written and having words on a page. But there are also times where it's so hard. Like, right now, when I am, I haven't slept a full night in months because I'm trying to finish this book. Um, you know, it's really dense epic fantasy, and I'm trying to make it work on command instead of being able to, like, sit and let the ideas come as I would perhaps like to do. I can't do that. And that is really hard and frustrating sometimes. But then it's also like, I really can't complain because I get paid to daydream for a living. So, you know, it's kind of like the best job ever. So I guess there aren't really, there's nothing I hate. Thank okay. you for the question. Mm -hmm. So the final question from the audience, it's kind of dovetails with my final question as well. Yay, perfect. Um, Hey, yeah, so she that question actually adds detail to my question, which is great. So uh, you have been so very incredibly supportive of our Read for Pixels campaign and not anti-violence poll. So here is where I'm going to try and mesh up the questions. So one, why do you support the cause of violence against women? And um, Mrs. Jen Kelly 22 asks, what compelled you to donate to Read for Pixels, and why do you think it's important for others to support and donate to the organization? I mean, this, this just seems like such a no-brainer to me. Like, of course I would support ending violence against women. Like, I got that question recently, too, and it was like, obviously? I, I, like, not to sound rude, but like, it seems like such a yes, of course. Um, there's, there's, it's like not even an option not to, so, um, it's like easily one of the most important causes that exists, <laughs> in my opinion. So, so yeah, that, that was like, um, when I was given the chance to help, it was like, uh, yes, let's do this now, go. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, there are people who, who actually come up to our faces and say to us, Violence against women doesn't exist. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see the amount of rage that just went through my body, but oh my. Oh my. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, <laughs> come to us and say, well, women are just as violent as men. And then we're, they're like, uh. No. 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 Sorry no. about that. No, no, no. Um, so we do get that. So that's why we sort of asked that. So Captain no, I, I, I don't mind the question. I just I feel like I don't have a good answer because to me it's like there is no answer. Duh, of course I'm going to do it. Um, but yeah, I guess I also forget that some people are horrible. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, so guys, we have to wrap up now because Susan has to get back to writing Win Witch. She has, uh, she has to hand it in in what, five days? Five days and then we're done. So I have, I, I, I'm, I'm not very good at letting go. Like, I have to make the book as perfect as I possibly can and slightly obsessive perfectionist with that. So that's what I'm trying to do. It's for okay. you guys. So what I'm going to do now, guys, I'm going to switch it back myself back on the screen 
And they're going to tell you, Susan and I are going to tell you right now all about what's in her goodie bag, including the prize that she added today. So let's do this. Um, right, guys. Okay, so as mentioned earlier, Susan has generously donated an awesome True Witch goodie bundle. And it comprises a signed and personalized first edition of True Witch. It's gorgeous. Oh, Susan, you have, you have a copy of the book there, right? To show them? Yes, I do. I do. It's so a first edition, guys. Now it's a different dust jacket. So this is special. And there's like some changes in it. So first edition. Yeah. And then there's also a special signed True Witch poster. I think with a map, I think, of the Witchlands. Is that correct? Yes. So it's the map of the Witchlands on one side. And then the other side is the like claim my ether, guide my blade from the monks, the monastery. OK. Yes. And here's the special, special surprise that Susan has added in just today. It's a tech. Susan, as you know, is a. Um, so for the donor who gets the bundle. So if you're an aspiring author or if you know someone who is, you know, you can get the bundle. And Susan will hopefully after she's handed in Winrich, Winrich first, Winrich first, we really need to know what happens. Um, then she will, she will, will connect you with Susan and um, she will critique the 10 pages, double spaced. So yes. it's just 10 pages of your story, your work in progress. So, okay, so let's see. Oh, Estira Gonzalez says, good luck with Winwich, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, did she, can you hear me? Because someone apparently, because um, Anusha said that nobody heard about the 10-page critique. So I think we'll get Susan to say it. So Susan, about the 10-page critique. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, an extra little item for the, for the uh, giveaway is that I will do a 10 page critique for somebody. So if you're a writer, um, aspiring author, it doesn't matter the genre, uh, just you know, 10 pages, typical format, which is double space times New Roman 12 font, uh, I will critique it for you. So you know, go in and buy that bundle, please. Yeah, it's not, it's not really buy, we can't sell it, guys, but Sorry. make the donation. Make yes, the donate. donate. Donate for this amazing, wonderful cause because you should, and uh, it's a good thing that you do. And then I will thank you by critiquing your pages. Okay, so I'm gonna switch back to me so I can share that cute little slide. Susan, tell me if you see it. Hang on, cute little slide to tell you guys where to go to get it. There's only one bundle, guys. Yeah, I see it. Okay, so you can go get it at uh, go donate for that bundle or any other geeky goodies and Indiegogo, you go to is.gd slash R4P Indiegogo 2016. And if you're a high fantasy fan, you might be interested in bidding for um, Steven Erickson's subterranean press editions of his Malazan books. Uh, that's up at is.gd slash R4P Malazan auction. And you can find out more about our Read for Pixels campaign uh, at is.gd slash read for pixels so wait i'm gonna stop this now and guys it's um the donation ask for susan's i'm gonna put susan back on screen the donation ask for susan's special 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 bundle which you're not gonna get anywhere else so this is giving this to one generous donor is just 135 dollars it's just 135 yeah it's 135 you get the first edition personalized and signed copy of Truth Witch hardcover that Susan showed just now, and you get Susan's got it again. Yay, Susan, the book! Yay! <laughs> and you get it also, you also get that beautifully illustrated map poster of the Witch Lens, and you get Susan helping you along a little bit with your work in progress. But uh, important thing to remember this is only for US donors. So if you're in the U.S., get yourself over there now and get this. So U.S. donors only. Okay, so we're going to wrap up now. And 
if you want to find out more about violence against women, I'll put myself back on screen. If you want to find out more about violence against women and how to stop it, including the, and uh, how to help people you know who've experienced it, including uh, domestic violence victims and rape and sexual assault victims, please go to our website at www.thepixelproject.net. And uh, to find out more about the celebrity male role model pixel reveal campaign to which all funds are going, um, and this is a campaign to get men and boys on board the cause because we can't, women can't do it alone. The entirety of society has to work together to stop it. As Susan said, it's changing culture that's so important. Please visit reveal.thepixelproject.net to learn more about it and to donate generously to help us reveal pixels and raise the $1 million for the cause. And now I'm putting you back to Susan because we will both say thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, guys. You're awesome. Thank yeah, you. and have a good day or good night wherever you are in the world, guys. And and um, if you want to, uh, if you want to watch more um, more Read for Pixels Google Hangouts with authors, you can go to our YouTube channel, thepixelproject.net, and there's a whole bunch there, almost sixty different Hangouts there. Wow. Susan's one will be recorded there too. Once we're done with this, it will process, YouTube will process it and it will go out automatically. So if you miss the beginning of this, you can absolutely go to our channel and click on it to find, uh, click there to find Susan's Hangout. So we'll say good night now, guys. Bye. Good night. Thank you.